Okay, guys, if everyone can start settling down, grab a seat, kick back, don't fall asleep. Okay, I think uh, while we wait for the last people to come through, um, I just want to ask all the Alasbesta staff, uh, maybe come up so people can see you properly. All right. Uh, all, all sweated up and uh, yeah, where's my AFF crew? Well, it's Donovan's crew, not my crew. Okay, guys, please start settling down. Okay, uh, what we didn't tell you is each of you have to sing a song now. <laughs> okay, I think there's quite a bit of uh, new stuff around. Sorry, can I have your attention? <whistles> okay, that works. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so just ask our, all our staff over. I think uh, it's only Donovan and maybe Arnold left and Melba from last year. Oh, Chantal, you all see here. Okay, um, and yeah, Stini is not here. Um, I, I really, really, really want to thank all of you, and I think everyone here needs to thank you for what you've done. From the packing of the goodie bags to assisting Donovan with almost anything and everything, and uh, leaving all your other work behind for the sake of Donovan and myself. Um, the other people also at the back, the IT people, um, Adrian and his crew, um, I think you all agree it's an amazing job that they're doing. Um, it's no longer a point where I believe any uh, of us directors can take any credit for it. It's the hard work that these people are doing. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for all the late nights, for all the uh, sweat and tears. And um, yeah, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, then I think one other matter that I would just like to address is maybe if Liesl can just get up. Uh, just we, <laughs> I just want to thank her as well, and I think especially all the international guests, all the effort she's done with all the traveling arrangements and doing everything on behalf of them, trying to get everything sorted from their flights to their trips to cancellations and, you know, th this way and that way around. Thank you so much for what you've done. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, those of you that have been here before know that we try and keep the workshops um, as informal as we possibly can. Um, last year we still had a bit more space in the hall, so we actually had a table in front um, with a little panel. Um, I think at the moment the panel basically consists um, of myself, Edran, and some of the other tech guys. Um, I think Edran will most likely come forward now. I hope so. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think what I really want to encourage is at any time, put up your hand, wave if you have a comment or a question. Um, it's only two talks, um, really, and at the end of the day, um, the more questions you ask, the more interactive it can be, um, and the more we learn from each other. I think all of the topics that we handle here, we don't regard ourselves as experts in it. Um, but again, through impatience, we've actually just said we want to get closer to uh, optimal production. So, um, yeah, we don't see ourselves as experts, so we would rather appreciate anyone's comments. And I think a lot of these things also depend on your perspective and the way you view things. Um, so I'll just wait for Marlene just to put my presentation up. Those of you that were here last year um, will remember that we did a 
presentation on precision orchard development. Um, and it's all basically um, done by measuring up um, with a drone. Um, and with that, trying to basically just manage more variables um, in the orchard and when we do the development make more informed decisions and that could range from anything from drainage um, to road direction management some of the people that were with us yesterday also saw that and i think um, it's all just about you realize that when you make a orchard development um, it's actually it's Um, yeah, so it's actually quite stupid if you don't put a lot of effort in it because that orchard's going to stand there for anything from 10 to 20 years. So by making a proper investment a lot of the time, you actually save a bit on labor and production costs um, by making it more feasible to get in the orchards. And I think where we are today with trellising, with all of that, um, more and more technology also becomes more re readily available. And the use of that in these um, needs to be considered so it actually makes sense. Um, all right, so I'm just going to do a quick recap on what we did last year um, and more really just show you a few photos um, just for those of you that were here because I would just like to show you what some of these orchards ended up like and also uh, things that we've learned over the last season. So obviously, I think this was more or less the first time that we flew. Um, that's why almost the whole tech team is there because I think that was the first drone on our farm. Um, so since then, I think, uh, well, we have our own drone and uh, we try and do it a bit better. And that's also a thing is I think the inf efficiency of this process has increased where, you know, a lot of times it was a large discussion between myself and Adrian about how we should do the design um, with him starting to understand what I want in the orchard, most of the times it's almost he, um, he goes out, flies the orchard, um, calculates the data, and by the time I get to him, he's already mapped the orchard, and you know it's really just do I want to make changes. And I think with the last two, I didn't even make any changes. So I think um, it's a very good method to uh, use at the end of the day, and it's very interactive. Um, so you'll remember we had this orchard. Um, it's got a pretty steep slope over here, and it was bad air. Now there, the bulldozer already went and changed the slopes. Um, uh, but we, this portion was never a proper orchard. Um, so our vision was just to take this and make it um, farmable again. So it was either leave it to grassland or take the contour route and, and start planting. So you can see what the slope of the valley was like and how we built it down. So this ridge here went all the way past that tree. That tree was on the ridge and it went down like that. So we really spent a bit of money on this orchard to make it accessible. Um, so you could just see how we changed a few things. After the first flight, um, did the modeling. Um, so the blue lines is just where water runoff would be. Um, so you just build a 3D model and um, model what the water flow would be like and try and channel that. Um, we dug profile pits. Um, Ideally, you actually want this to be more regularly spaced, um, but that's also the things that you learn. So theoretically, you can go in advance, plot those areas where you want the stake to be put in. So whether that's every 20 meters, every 50 meters. Um, and there is definite changes in the soil types here and the soil depth. Um, so that's what we wanted to look at. Um, and it's actually nice to see a visual photo like this um, because where the white spots are, you can see the subsoil is a lot um, higher. Um, so you need to take that into consideration whether you're ridging or putting um, terraces in. Um, because if that ends up at the top, the tree won't grow that well. Um, so you can see, I just want to go back to this one. You can see how many different blue lines there are. And you can see now there's basically two strong valleys and a little bit on this side. If I remember correctly, this was the road on this side. Um, so you can see it's, it's well uh, drained off to the sides, and now obviously you go and build um, contours on that, or terraces. So you can see before, after again, um, well channeled. So um, this was what we started doing, and basically what I just did here 
It's a bit more complex when we start doing this. Um, normal straight lines is a lot easier because you know it's not that subjective. There's a row direction and you go. There's less variables. Um, but with this type of development that goes around angles and trying to keep a constant four meter on the horizontal, you actually have to put a bit more effort in. Um, so you would see, for example, um, the contours were flowing this way and then suddenly the lines were dropping off the contour. Um, so you need more reference lines within the orchard um, to restart basically your four meter spacing. Otherwise at some point it's following the four meter horizontal and it's just going straight down the hill. So you, we basically just made a few notes and uh, changed the road directions. The other thing that you will see is um, on this part, the water was draining off this way and into that valley there. And then from this side, there's a ridge over there that's the highest point of the orchard. Um, so the water was draining this way and from this way across into that valley. So the two valleys that you saw was basically those two main valleys. All right, so this was the design and you can see where the lines are thinner, um, that's um, a very easy slope. And uh, the places where it's thicker, that becomes more steep. But even now with the thicker parts, it's only a 5%. So what we did with the orchard development is to say, we want it between zero and 5%. We don't want to be above 5% gradient. Um, and yeah, so this is all well within the, the parameters. And then the road obviously is a, a bit above that. So just going to run through it, you can see the development carrying on, um, starting to plot out. Um, that was Lawrence before he went to aerobotics. <laughs> um, so uh, plotting out the orchard, see bringing in the stakes, um, bringing in the excavator. That was just, just the road, so that's not the planting area. Um, little bobcat helps quite a bit and started building the contours. Um, I tend to refer to it as contours. Let's call it a modified contour or a terrace for that matter um, because it does drain to a direction. Um, I have to say it's a very nifty machine. Um, don't want to do too much marketing on it. Um, but last year, was it last year or the year before? I think the year before we bought um, that year at the Maluma Symposium. Um, I would say there was probably two impulse buys that my dad did in his life, and this was one of it. Um, but I've, I've never regretted it. And now the second one is standing there, so I'm taking that one home. We can't uh, have it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I have to say, we, last year we spent quite a bit of time uh, measuring fuel consumption, um, running time on this thing, um, and also the rate at which it works, how that compares to other machines. And compared to excavator and compared to TLBs, um, from a cost efficiency point of view, it's a really good investment. Um, and I won't say it runs well below a TLB and an excavator, but it is sufficiently under, so it does save you money. Um, okay, so don't want to mark it too much. Um, for what it's worth, five tonner. Um, all right, you can see the modified contours starting to develop there. Um, so the flat spot you would drive on and put the tree right at the end of that. Again, you can just see, and um, if you look at the roof of the five tonner there, um, you'll see it outside, obviously, and you take it parallel. It's basically within a two row, um, that's the top of it. So what we try and do as well is when you look at the slope, um, you have to think logically about it. If you're on a seven meter spacing and you have a, 10% um, um, slope, then you're already sitting on a, seven, a 700 millimeter contour. So we don't really want to be that high. The moment you, so then it starts making sense to bring your spacing down. So that's why we prefer the four by two as well on these contours. Um, and we're actually planning on doing a lay mass development, which is on a t two meter contour. Um, so it's all depending on the slope. All right, you can just see it there. A little bit poorer soils, um, but yeah, very, very well, um, very good to actually see the image. Uh, Idran, what was the name again? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, Ron says it's just basic shading on the um, image, just to exaggerate the contours. So just to clearly see the lines, and you can see specific places where you know two contours are coming into one because of the gradient change and things like that. Um, but it just gives you a good indication of where the lines are going. Um, it run always builds in a little stat column for me as well. Um, these days, a little bit more um, developed. The specific tree locations. Um, so I think you know, from a precision farming point of view, I believe this is the future. We need to go that way um, as GPS technology and what's that other thing that you always forget? The the velocity must meet. Okay, he says it's inertial navigation. So the way he explained it to me in layman's terms is they basically calibrate this little gadget um, from the factory level. So from that position, it calculates its position around the globe. So theoretically, that's a lot more accurate than GPS is today. Um, and that technology shouldn't be too far away. So theoretically, when you start harvesting, when you start pruning, um, then when you start correlating that with drone data, with uh, plotting of your orchards, again, you know, your measurements just go into a much higher level. Uh, just indicating the flow of the water, I've explained that. Uh, basically, just indications of where we want the main lines to be and what we want to do. Um, started developing, started planting the trees there. You can see the trees in the orchard. Going through there all the way. Um, just following the contours again. So um, this is what it currently looks like on Google Earth, just to give you an indication. And you can see how well it matches. Um, so it is actually very accurate at the end of the day. Uh, this was the first development we did without a drone. We just winged it. <laughs> and it ended, out, um, ended up pretty well. Um, but we were stupid, you know, we would have Today, I would rather put a valley in there to do drainage at that point. Um, this is basic stats that Iran today gives me. Um, so this, I love this. Uh, to me, it makes orchard development so easy because now we go and stake this. I have so much information. I know what's happening in my orchard. And as long as I don't have too many of these red lines, I'm happy that my orchard slope is correct. Um, I'm not going to struggle to work in the orchards when it's raining. Um, you know, we did, uh, where we farm these slopes as high as 65% gradient. So it's ridiculous. You don't want to go downhill. You want to work around it. Um, so it's just a nice method. So basically, this was just a drainage road that we put in there in the middle of the block. And one of the main reasons was the row length was over 150 meters. So we try and work in these different factors. Another development, uh, we'll most likely see this tomorrow. Um, this section here has been planted and that whole section there has been planted. So everyone that was on the orchard visit with us, uh, the international guests, we were in this section yesterday here. Um, and yeah, tomorrow we will see um, Netafim, the trials are busy dripping out um, to show what the infiltration of the drippers look like on the ridges. So we will see that tomorrow so that you can grasp the full effect of it. Uh, just another development. Again, you can see the contours flowing, row direction, and you can see how um, nicely the rows are there. All right, that's it from me. Um, I uh, don't know if there's any questions with regards to this. Mark, any comments or questions? You're the real clever guy. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> All right, you'll address them when you talk. Yeah, I think um, the best way to explain it is if the slope's running this way, we try and bank it that way. So we always do that because if you do have a point where the water comes across, when it goes onto a valley like that, it pulls it down. Um, but definitely you don't want, if you have a 200 mils in X amount of time, you don't want that to start running over the contours. So uh, the more that's banked, the better actually. 
Um, the only point there as well is if you go too far and it's you know muddy and slippery, then again stuff can start slipping into the, the banks again. But <laughs> rather that than off the hill, so that's a very, very important point. Okay, anything else? Any comments? Lawrence, you love it at all hard clip it. Stage fright cream. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's that then. I don't know where there is Edran. All right, good. I'll hand over to Edran for the rest of the session. Okay, um, I think Xander mentioned it earlier that um, what we're basically doing now is just uh, demonstrating what we're passionate about in terms of technology and using technology to um, help us with um, s basically our daily struggles. So um, we're not trying to tell you how to do it or whatever or trying to show uh, that we're fancy or anything. Um, this is just basically a demonstration just to get the creative juices flowing, to get someone um, maybe talking about an idea they have as well. So, um, uh, yeah, this is just a demonstration of what we're doing. So, um, before I get to that, uh, the topic I'm going to discuss now is basically, um, like I said, there's data capturing platforms. So, all of us have this challenge that um, we gather data on a daily basis, um, whether it's um, when you're harvesting, you need to um, uh, gather data on how much you're harvesting in what time frame, or if you're spraying, or whatever task you're busy with, you're gathering data. And traditionally what we used to do is, you write it on a piece of paper or on the back of a cigarette box or something, and eventually it'll hopefully end up somewhere where it's going to be usable. And if you were really good, uh, you'd plug it into a very fancy Excel spreadsheet and um, draw a graph. And um, that would hopefully tell you something. And um, then it'll be forgotten. And um, so, and, and somewhere in between there, someone had to capture that into the computer. So the all the little papers had to come into the office, none of them had to get lost, and um, someone had, it, had to capture it and make no mistakes, uh, and uh, they um, shouldn't mess up the Excel spreadsheet, um, the formulas and everything, so uh, if all goes well, then, then you would have a great system, but uh, that's not what happened. So the challenge was, how could we do this better? And, and how can we take it a step further and um, make the data more readily available and um, so that there's only one human element in the process and that's the one that captures it. And um, we, in the beginning we thought, well, we could develop all of this um, because we have a programmer, we can develop something but we soon realized there's too many things to develop and too little time, so we needed to go and look for things that could help us. So what I'm going to show you now is a platform, some of you might know it, um, it's freely available on the internet, um, and you can start using it for free, and is, as soon as you, I think, rack, rack up a couple of users on the system, you start paying a fee per user per month, um, that's really very afford affordable. Um, the system is called Fulcrum, so it's basically just a data capturing platform where you can go and you develop a little form um, on their web page. It's really easy. You drag and drop. You say you want a, a text field here and you want a selection field here and a date time field and it should capture the GPS coordinate of the phone or whatever or the tablet. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, you publish that form and it publishes it to your uh, mobile devices and that you use in the field um, for your people to capture the information on those forms that you design. And uh, that data is stored um, into a, um, 
a database in the back end that's readily available for you to go and look at the data. So uh, I'm going to um, just play the video basically that they have on, the, on their front page. Um, okay, there it goes. Uh, there's some sound as well. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so um, I'm not trying to punt a certain platform. There might be others like this. This is just the one that we um, found. Uh, I don't know. I can't even remember how we found it um, a couple of years ago. So um, this is, like I said earlier, where you go uh, onto their website. It's just a little screen grab um, from a section of the of their website. You create an account. You log in. And then you have all kinds of different fields um, that you can pick from. And you can decide according to what information you want to capture for a certain task or whatever. You drag those fields over. And um, this is an example of one of the forms that we use um, for when we have um, our um, plant equipment out in the field. We need to track how many hours, especially if it's on a contract um, basis, contract machines. We need to track um, what the hours are um, when they start, what's the machine hours when they finish, what's the fuel consumption, and, all of the, and what's the tasks they're busy with. So um, then according to that, we can draw all kinds of information from that. So um, for, for instance, uh, how long did it take for all the machines to complete a certain task, or uh, how, uh, how much fuel did we use, or whatever question we would like to ask regarding that. So uh, this is actually a form that Zander built, um, and he put a date field in there so that we can know what the date is. Um, uh, okay, this is all in Afrikaans, so again for the convenience of the Afrikaans folk, but I'll translate it. Um, so that's the machine. So that's just the field where you go and you put in um, a list. So you, so you put in your own um, names for different machines, and when you um, use that field, it becomes a choice field where you can choose a specific machine. So uh, the person that inputs the data doesn't need to type in the machine name or something. You can choose it from a list. Um, that's the beginning hours, the ending hours um, on the hour meter, um, how much diesel did it use, what activity, and that's also a choice field, so um, what acti activity was he busy with, um, that's how many meters, so for, from, for certain tasks, maybe you're building ridges, you would like to know how many meters of ridge did uh, he build in that day or whatever, and uh, on which farm. So you build your form like this, and then you just go through the procedure to publish it. And then when you open it up, um, the, it's got uh, Fulcrum as an app that you download onto your mobile device. And you log in with your username and password. You, you can also, in, in your user account, you can create sub-users. So you, for each operator or whatever that needs to use the device to capture data, you can create an account for him, and he logs in with his own credentials, and um, it gets recorded who did the transaction. So that's that's the nice thing about that. And then when you open up, uh, your app and you've logged in, it synchronizes the form, and um, you it, it'll look like this. So there you'll have your form, 
So um, as it's got the uh, today's date populated by default, um, and then you'll get um, the machine field. When you tap on that, it'll open up this screen with your choice. You can go and choose which one. So it's the, let's say, the Volvo excavator there. And um, then you fill in the beginning hours, the ending hours. Um, if there was, uh, let's say, filled up with diesel, how much did he uh, fill up with? And on the activity field, you'll um, choose which activity, which is also a list that you um, decided yourself. And it'll look like this, and you'll just submit it um, by clicking on Save. And then you've captured it. And then when you go to um, look at your data, this is basically how it looks. So you've got all your information captured there, and it's already in the system, and um, it doesn't have to go to the office. It happens in real time. Um, as soon as he clicks Save and he has an internet connection, it'll be uploaded. If he doesn't um, have an internet connection, then it gets saved locally, and as soon as you get to a place where you have a connection, all those saved um, records gets uploaded um, to the system, and it'll be available here. From here, there's different options that you have. You can export it to an Excel file or a CSV file and import it into something else. Or if you're um, a bit technically inclined uh, or know someone who is, then um, it's got an interface where you can use other software to interface with that. So maybe you have business intelligence software like um, Microsoft's Power BI or Click or whatever. And if you use that, then you can write a connector for this and it can pull the data in and visualize it for you. So um, it's it, it's very nice um, way of capturing data. And this is just something that we use uh, for a lot of our things. Um, are there any questions on this particular system? Um, Idran, I uh, just want to make a comment quickly. Because um, Idran almost uh, went well, he's, he's ignoring something. I think the, the question almost is, you know, how long will it take to have programmed that, um, you know, as a new software kit? So if you had to design that app from scratch, what would that time be, more or less, uh, if you didn't use Fulcrum? Yeah, well, if we had to do it ourselves, it's difficult to say, but it could take months. So um, depends how many people... Um, but it, let's say in terms of man hours, um, it'll be a couple of months probably to do it yourself. So you need to look at um, which systems are out there to use. Uh, yeah, what I'm asking the question is, at the end of the day, um, that's, Iran said it initially, he said, you know, there's just too much to spend time on. So what do they focus on as qualified people and what can the rest of us assist with? Now, to build that form basically probably took me half an hour to an hour. So you can see just because, you know, the linkages and the background's already built, um, it's actually very simplistic. And it's really, to build that was, you know, drag and drop. It's a really easy process. Um, I, I'm not too uh, technical and I got it right. So, and I think well, the other thing that I just want to mention as well is, um, what works well with us is, well, one of the frustrating things on a lot of platforms is all our blocks on the farms um, starts from A1 to D, E, E, F, whatever. So, and it could be A2 and A3 and whatever, and it repeats itself. But now you have Hemor, which is the one farm with its A1 and that one. So, you know, it's so easy for someone to get confused and choose the wrong farm. Um, and we don't really want to change our block names, and it's a little bit of this and that. And the nice thing about this form builder is you can actually build in parameters. So you can say, um, you know, if I choose form Emor, it should only display Emor's blocks. So that when you actually choose A1, that's always A1 on Emor, it doesn't get confused. So the fact that you can build in those parameters um, and again, yes, you can do it with Excel, um, but like Edran said, at the end of the day, even just to build something on Excel, Excel that captures the same information um, is a lot more frustrating. Yeah, and the thing is with Excel is that it needs to be captured, and you're not going to capture your Excel um, spreadsheet in the field. 
So then it needs to be captured on paper and it needs to arrive at the office and not get lost and somebody has to capture it correctly and all that. So it's complexity that it doesn't need to be there. So um, if you have a similar problem, um, look at Fulcrum, look at uh, Google around, maybe there's something else, something better maybe. Um, I don't know, but this works perfectly for us. It's very easy, anyone can do it. There's even a lot of um, videos on their site that shows you step by step how to do it. They make it really easy. So um, I think it can make a huge difference uh, if you have challenges like that. And it's actually nice as well that um, you can choose icons. You can upload any image. So for um, the land prep app, I just went and downloaded, downloaded a picture of excavator a little image and that's the icon so at the end of the day it's also easy for the labor and I think from a farming point of view um, it's actually quite interesting it's my 10th year on the farm now and labor then versus labor now is completely different you know today you don't struggle to find labor that can work a tablet that can work a phone I actually struggle with my older labor so um, data capturing five years ago was limited to you know someone that you know you've been pulling through the ranks for the last few years um, today it becomes more and more easy to actually uh, you know just find people even on your lower staff even our harvesting staff you know the guys that really just finished school but the ability to work with these with this technology and do the data capturing themselves so theoretically with a system like that you'd be able to actually just give each of your foremen uh, um, you know, a device or a cell phone, your drivers, you know, their checklists, anything you could build, basically build on that, and it's very user-friendly. Um, any questions? Right, uh, I think then we can go to the next one. Okay, so uh, you see that it's uh, about precision harvesting. So um, what we used to do is when we harvested, um, we uh, harvested in our avocados into lug boxes, which is just a basically 16 kilogram um, plastic box, uh, for those of you not familiar. Um, and what we used to do is um, everyone harvested and um, each laborer would um, keep his boxes in a separate group from the others and it'll stand somewhere under a tree hopefully and um, after the um, harvesting session they would go and um, count their boxes and it'll get written on a p piece of paper and that'll go to the office and um, at the end of the day and um, we used to struggle uh, that it should be captured within a week into the system, which used to be an Excel spreadsheet and later on became a, a piece of software that we wrote. Um, but uh, we managed to narrow it down that we could, uh, the next day that it could be captured and everything so that we can have the information in a database. But we wanted to take it a step further um, because there was a lot of information that we still uh, wanted to have. We didn't know exactly how many kilograms we were harvesting. Um, we didn't know how many kilograms each laborer were, was harvesting um, because we didn't scrutinize each lug box and see if it was fully picked. You sort of looked at the whole bunch of them and see if they looked more or less okay. Um, but you didn't really know. And um, in terms of uh, efficiency, we we really didn't know how efficient we were harvesting. So we wanted something a bit more. So we looked into um, using um, scales and bulk bins, and um, there were some great systems out there, and they looked really promising. And um, the one thing we didn't like about them is most of these systems, um, they capture all the details. So. Um, th the harvester will come and he harvests the fruit into his bag and he comes to the scale and he um, weighs his uh, bag and then tips it over into the bulk bin and then he goes on and, and harvests further. 
and um, each, uh, let's say, bag um, that gets weighed gets nicely captured into a database, but the problem for us was that um, it wasn't readily available. You had to, um, it, it gets stored locally on the scale, and then at the end of the day or whenever you would have to go and download it, either by taking a little SD card out or something, or coming with a USB stick or something and um, downloading the data or, or taking the scale and plugging it into a computer or something. And, um, but it wasn't readily al available and we wanted something that was um, available in real time so that we could know what's going on and so that we can know if we weren't making our targets for the day, we can know it early on. So within the first hour or two, we want to know, are we going to make our targets or should we speed up or are we okay or what's going on? And with that systems, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. So we want to st wanted to step that up uh, a bit further. So we decided, okay, we're going to develop something that just uses a commercial scale um, that outputs the data um, that you can plug into it. And um, we connected that to a tablet and um, luckily we already, um, we were writing a, um, a mobile app for other things. So we added onto it um, the whole harvesting thing um, so that it, ca it can read the scales and um, do the transactions and transmit it in real time um, over the internet to our database. And um, then we realized, but our scale, or our um, tablets also have GPS on them. So while they were doing it, they were, um, the, the scale was mounted on the bulk bin trailer. So everyone would harvest the trees around the trailer, bring the fruit in, and then when those trees were, um, all the fruit were harvested on those trees, the trailer would move on to the next, say, four trees um, that they would start picking on. So, and the uh, tablet operator was standing right next to the trailer. So, I if we just started to capture the GPS position of the tablet, we would have a fair idea of, at that point where the tablet was, what was the weight of fruit being picked at that point. Um, so, then we could start doing heat maps as well. So, where in the orchard was the, um, all the fruit? Um, so, wh where's more fruit and where's less fruit? So these were all ideas that we started to uh, put into place and um, at the Maluma Day last year, we basically started with this system. Um, there's a little video um, of our team just doing the prototype. So um, you'll see it's very, uh, it's not very streamlined yet. This is probably the first or the second try. So each laborer has a tag they scan a tag to identify themselves and um, once they're identified and you can see we're still doing a backup paper system there for in case the system fails so this is really in the beginning and uh, then it gets weighed so um, the scale transmits through bluetooth to this device and um, the record gets captured and then um, after that's done uh, we also scan the bin um, so we know with each bag that comes in, in, into which bin does it go, so that we also know the weight of each individual bin. Um, each bin has its own ID um, on an RFID tag, and so we can know each bin, what's the weight. So if you were to come along with another device, you can scan the bin and you'll know how many kilograms is in there. Um, so, okay, all right, so... Uh, that's just a picture of the thing. Uh, it's not really very visible, but you um, you can see it shows 21.87 there and 21.87 on the screen there. Um, that's just the interface uh, on the tablet. Uh, this is basically just how it looks. Um, the other nice thing is that because you're capturing this on the tablet, um, you can also build um, sort of a... Um, uh, what's on a round lace? Yeah, like a well, a list and you uh, like a ranking list. So you can rank um, the best performer to the worst performer. So when they come along and scan, they can see where am I on the list, and it sort of motivates the bottom guys 
to, um, to move up because th they, they start competing with one another. Um, they want to see at the end of the day, um, have the bragging rights to say, I was the best picker of the day, or I beat you, um, you beat me yesterday, I beat you today, or whatever. So we really found that that works, and they start driving each other. So each time one get, uh, comes and weighs a bag, this list will get updated. And um, you can, uh, because it's all connected to a central database, um, you, if you work with more than one tablet, if someone scans in a bag at another tablet, your tablet will also update um, because it uh, constantly synchronizes between the tablet and the database um, that's on the internet. So um, this just shows you um, that uh, that person was picking 3.3 bags per hour um, at that stage and that one's doing 1.94. And uh, it also tells you um, how many bags in total each one has done um, so far. And then you have a little status button there that you can get some information for the day's picking. So you can say, uh, see that uh, the total bags uh, so far is, I think, 180, if I see correctly there. And um, what's the uh, total um, amount of uh, harvesters uh, that's working on this um, block? And how many bins have we filled um, up to now? Uh, what's the um, gross weight? What's the net weight, um, the totals? And what's the average weight per bin? So, um, and that's running figures. As soon as a new bag comes in, it gets updated the whole time. Um, so that gives you, not, and it also gives you an indication um, how long ago it was synchronized to the server. So maybe if you lose a connection, um, it won't get synchronized. And if it, I think, tried like three times to connect, this whole thing turns gray so that you don't um, think you're working with um, real-time data. It just gives you an indication that uh, don't go with this. It, uh, it's not up to date anymore. Um, so that's just the screen um, when they come and weigh their bags. So um, the um, harvester will be identified by his or her tag. And um, then the screen will show up showing who it is, then you just check that it's the right person. And um, then as soon as the bag's put on the scale, it'll show a weight indication there, and they'll just double check it and see if it's correct. And then they'll just save the record. And um, this happens quite quickly. Um, so this is a, just a um, picture showing you the points. Each, each point is a transaction. So um, a geolocated transaction, so you can see how they moved along the rows there um, as they harvested. And um, so, as I said earlier, what you can start to do now is to do a heat map. And you can do it um, so that it's weighted according to the weight of the bags. So it'll um, show you where the most weight was harvested and um, where, the le uh, um, where the weight was less. So you can see here yeah, that there is a problem area there, and it sort of makes sense because here's a um, little river running there, and um, it's saturated soils, and the trees are in poor condition. So you start to get an idea of um, what's going on. And if you compare this across seasons, you'll also maybe it'll start telling you a story. So. Um, that's basically where we are at the moment. Um, each season we're refining on the system, trying to get it better. Um, the nice thing about this is as soon as you have that data in the background, you can start doing some other things. You can now start um, letting the server where the data is um, go through it the whole time, through the data, make predictions, and give you a notification on your Apple Watch or on your phone or whatever, and tell you, um, this is where we are. It, it can send that notification to a manager and there's no human involvement. It just happens in the background because everything is already um, in the cloud and running on a server somewhere and the data is updated in real time and you can start making real time decisions. In the future what you can do is you can start integrating now. You can use tracking systems on your trucks and um, you can make predictions on when your, bills, uh, your bins are filled and it can send a notification to the truck driver that he must come and pick up the bins and take it to the pack house. So there's a lot of improvements that one can still make on this thing. Um, and, and that's basically our challenge and our 
um, the thing that gets us up in the morning. So um, are there any, I think that's the end of my story on this subject. Um, if there are any questions. I think we have a lot of time still. James. Thanks. Um, yeah, very interesting. So I, I think generating heat maps like that, extremely important for farmers. Um, I'm from, from aerobotics, so we actually generated heat maps um, like that as well during the harvesting process um, to try and correlate drone data to um, yield data and spe specifically zones showing stress to how much yield comes out of there at the end. Um, we took a slightly um, coarser and, and rougher approach, so we assumed that each bag was going to weigh a similar amount, and um, we've got people on the tractors checking that. And then from the cell phone app, we just added a marker whenever a bag was emptied um, to generate the heat map. But what was interesting there is when we did the numbers at the end, we found certain zones um, generating 20 tons per hectare, this is in apples, more than other zones. And if we think of what um, Kurs was saying this morning, you know, it's, this, it's the same input costs across that, that whole orchard but you're missing out on 20 tons per hectare in certain parts of the orchard. So that really shows you where to focus to make a correction for, um, for next year and increase profitability. I think um, James made a very good point there, um, is when you start capturing this data, the nice thing is nothing is in isolation anymore. So now you're capturing harvesting data, you're capturing your NDVI data on your um, tree health, you're capturing um, soil mapping data, um, all kinds of data, you, you're starting to capture that and you are, um, if you geo-reference all that, then you can start making correlations. Um, you can start leveraging all these fancy things like machine learning to try and find correlations um, that you won't necessarily see um, just by looking at the data or looking at pictures or graphs. So then you can um, when you see that there's certain areas that's doing 20 tons and other areas doing three tons in the same orchard, then it'll start telling you why that's happening. And you can go to those places in the orchards and go and see what's going on here. And it'll teach you um, what you need to do to get the other parts um, of your orchard to do the same. And, and I think that's how we're going to get to these high, higher production levels. Um, we're starting to micromanage. Um, so we're not managing an orchard anymore, we're m now m managing parts of an orchard. And in future we'll get to managing a certain tree and we might get to managing certain branches um, on their own and, and referencing branches on databases. I mean, it sounds far-fetched now, but all we need is the systems to allow us to do that easily. So, and, and, and those things are coming. Um, if I can just make a comment as well, just before the question. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for us has been um, as farmers that you sit at a point where, you know, your irrigation information is on one platform, your harvesting is on another platform, and this is on that platform, and that, and uh, nutrient management is on another platform, and, that, you know, everything's on a different platform. And at the end of the day, if you want to correlate, you have to, you know, somehow get all of that into a new data database, and a lot of that times that ends up being in Excel. Um, and I think, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of Adrian, but I think that's, that's to a large extent what we're trying to do on our side. So to try and, you know, just for our own business, get to a point where we can draw information from different systems. Um, Edan spends a lot of time in when we ch when we choose a specific system, um, he would look at what their database management is, if I'm using the right word, um, to select the right program so that he could actually tap into that information and draw that into our system, um, so that that correlation becomes an automatic calculation. Um, so that is one of the biggest challenges, I believe. Yeah, I think what Zander is trying to say is that integration is key we need to we can't work in isolation we can't um, if you're developing a system that you're making available commercially it's critical uh, you're not going to develop the full system um, it's not likely so it's it's crucial for um, developers of systems to make it so that it can integrate with other systems and other sources of data so that 
um, because we need that integrated approach. Otherwise, we're looking at things in isolation and we can't make correlations. Um, so each, uh, um, let's say, each developer uh, um, of a system needs to find what he's good at and do that well and allow another guy that's, that's better at something else to do that and then integrate. Um, and I know it's a utopian view maybe um, because commercial um, concerns come into play and that's all fair. Um, but I mean, that's the ideal world is so that we can have a totally integrated system available to us um, so that all the information um, is um, readily available and consolidated to make uh, the best decisions. Um, Niall. Uh, Adrian, earlier you spoke about um the labor picking between, say, 1.9 bags and three, uh, what do you call it, bags per whatever. Uh, is this based on, do they get paid per kg? So that becomes an uh, incentive. Uh, and if so, you know the pack house is always mechanical damage, mechanical damage. Has there been a correlation where the mechanical damage has gone up or does it outweigh it? Um, yeah, th I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the damage part. Um, I'll get to that quickly. The first part is um, in terms of um, the payment. So what we do is we basically say there's a target, and if you exceed the target, we pay you extra for, your, for the exceeding of the target. So if you harvest on target, um, then you'll just get the normal wage or whatever, but anything over... Um, you, it, it gets, so let's say if uh, the target was five bags per hour and you do 10 bags per hour, you'll get double the wage because you pick double the, um, the target. So that's basically how we, we do it, but I mean that's up to everyone um, to decide. So our system is set up that way and it, um, it looks for that and it calculates that um, so, and it just spits out a printout um, for our um, wage administrator to, um, to do that. Um, the second part about the quality thing is that's another thing that we need um, to incorporate in our system as well, is to sort of on-farm uh, let a guy come past, a supervisor or something, also with a tablet, and do spot checks, um, QC spot checks. And um, the one thing is that, uh, like you're concerned with, is mechanical damage, so that he can... Um, quickly tell the guys, whoa, guys, you, you're damaging the fruit, stop, um, and as soon as possible. Um, it doesn't help to find that out when the fruit's in the pack house, then it's, uh, it's already happened. So we need to do it for that sake, but also it'll generate nice data for us because the pack houses, um, they don't provide us with electronic data that integrates nicely into our system of how many of our fruit was sun damaged, how many was... Um, damaged by insects or whatever. So um, when we do our own QCs and it's captured onto the system, then we also have nice data about that. And um, we could also georeference that um, and try and correlate, uh, correlate that with scouting information that we also did by tablet in field um, and see, okay, so at that time of the year, we saw a high um, insect population in this part of the orchard. Oh, it correlates with all the damaged fruit, so it makes sense. Uh, something like that. So we, that's something that we really should do as well, still. If I, if I can just comment now, uh, I think the other thing is, what we've seen is we tend to, we have, I mean, we were scared of going to bulk bins um, because we know lug boxes, and now they're going to chuck the fruit in there and whatever, and I don't think we realize what hammering the fruit's taking you know, from loading it on the truck, you know, we've all seen it, they just chuck it on the truck and it slides over the back. And then when they need to put it on the top of the stack, the guy's too short and it, it not uh, nicks the fruit and things. That's the one thing. Um, the other thing that I've just seen, and that's one place, and it, I think that's a, another additional barrier that we can put in, um, or a measurement, is um, most of the times now what we'll find, because we limit the group to between 10 and 15 people per um, group to try and have them harvest as much and and not to have a point where anyone uh, is standing in a queue. So we try and m m meet that efficiency. Now obviously that changes from orchard to orchard. 
Um, long story short, the ideal would be um, that let's say there's three people harvesting in one orchard. The person running the scale, that person is also your, um, your quality control. Because what I've seen is, you know, you'll have people coming in, chucking the fruit in, and it just, instead of just putting the bag down and just pulling the bag up. So it's just, you know, noticing those small things. Um, and then in, in a situation like that, what we try and get is that, you know, on different levels, people should be responsible for what's happening under them. And I think that's something that, and it's kind of the conversations that we would have a lot of times is, you know, standing in the office and saying, okay, but, uh, so we are here now, uh, how can we make this thing more foolproof, what can we build in um, to in the future have more ideas about. And it's about also, you know, yes, the goalpost is there, but what interim things can we put in place that maybe is a bit sim simpler and easier for us to manage. Um, Um, okay, let's move to our next uh, presentation. I think that it's the last one from me. All right, okay, so this is our idea I've been toying with um, for a while. Um, and uh, I think a lot of us have this issue when it's time to put in crop estimates, um, how are you doing it? And um, I think a lot of us basically uh, do it like this. Um, you, your guys go up to the tree and then you say, okay, let's scout every tenth tree and tell me how many uh, lug boxes am I going to fill out of that tree and write it down. And then the guys like that at the tree uh, trying to figure out and it, uh, it differs according to who's doing this, uh, the estimates, how accurate an estimate you're going to get. Um, I saw a study that the uh, um, it's actually a trial that the Australians did, um, I think, at the University of Queensland or some, uh, I think it was there, um, that they tried to correlate um, NDVI or different um, types of, um, of uh, let's say, uh, indexes, um, vegetation indexes, to try and find out if they can correlate that with uh, crop load and do crop estimates that way. And they um, had some success, but the interesting thing for me there was that they al also reported on the accuracy um, of their control that was a human going through and um, doing an estimate. And it wasn't very accurate. Um, so that's what we find as well. So it seems to be a universal problem. And um, you know, you hear about all these things, people um, doing uh, um, at malls um, or shopping centers, they'll do, um, uh, they'll fly a drone over the parking lot and it'll count the number of cars there and they'll look at how their parking spaces are utilized and things like that. And it all happens through uh, computer vision principle. And um, then you hear about other fruit industries um, that do these things. Um, that have uh, computer vision models that are suited to their application where it can pick up um, uh, citrus fruit or apples or um, whatever. And um, I realized, well, we don't, I don't know of something like that on avocados. And um, I'm going to try and see if I can fine tune um, one of these computer vision models for avocados. And um, how it basically works is um, the clever machine learning folk, um, and uh, I think uh, the other phrase that people throw around a lot is artificial intelligence, but um, uh, as a side note, I heard the other day that there's a difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. So um, if, if something is written in code, in computer code, it's called machine learning, and if it's written in a PowerPoint presentation, it's called artificial intelligence. So <laughs> that's just a, a little uh, techie joke. But anyway, so how these things work is that um, the, co the, the clever folk, has, um, they've built computer vision models that are just a base model where the computer or the machine or whatever has learned um, how to distinguish objects. So it looks like the human eye works, 
it sees edges and it sees different shades and all that. And that's already done. So all the hard work, um, we're already living in the day and age where the hard work in terms of that has been done. And it's been made available and you can build on that. And you can just retrain that model um, to look for specific objects. And um, it's become fairly easy. So how you do it is you take a whole lot of photos um, of trees and um, uh, the more the better. Um, and then you take those trees and you annotate them. You go and draw little boxes around each um, fruit and um, you input that into the, um, the system to retrain the model um, using all those pictures with all the annotations. And the annotation tells it this is an avocado. And, um, and you give it all kinds of different avocados. Some of them are in the shade, some of them are obscured by a leaf. Um, some of them are nicely visible. And the more different types of these um, images you feed the system, um, the better it gets at distinguishing it. And the more uh, pictures you feed them uh, as well, um, the better. So I thought, well, let's just as a proof of concept, just throw something together. I didn't have a lot of time last week. And um, I asked Zander to just uh, take, um, I think he gave me around 60 or 70 photos and I took 50 of them and put it into the model and this is a bare minimum. This is, uh, this is really um, not enough photos, but I thought, well, let's give it a shot. So I put in 50 photos, annotated them. It took me hours to do it and I, I got rather good at um, drawing uh, squares around avocados and um, then put it into the model and the model does this um, in the background. So that's basically what they call a neural net and I'm not going to go into it but uh, it's just a graphical representation but um, there's, I think there's a reason that it sort of looks like a brain um, because that's all neural pathways. It's a, it's a simulation, not a simulation, it's like an emulation of how your brain works and it's actually quite interesting once you read about these things. So then uh, when it finished, um, it tells you, okay, it takes, a, takes about an hour or something and it runs the thing and it, um, and it does uh, statistical tests on the model as it goes along and it tries to get to a, a peak um, success on, uh, as it learns, it evaluates against itself and then it learns again and it sees how good it gets and then when it peaks, it stops. And um, then that's your model and that's how good it's going to get with the information you've given it. And um, so it told me, okay, it's finished and I kept uh, 20 odd photos aside that it's never seen before and I said, okay, now it's time to test it and I put those photos in and the, uh, here they are. And uh, I hope it's somewhat visible for you, but on the left is the photo as I gave it to it, and this is what it gave back. And there's the squares that it went and, and it uh, um, put those squares around the avocados, where, um, which it identified as avocados. So in this picture, um, I couldn't really see some that it missed. Um, the nice thing that it does is with each square that it draws, it also gives you an indication of a probability um, that it thinks it's correct. And so where, where it was correct, you'll get a probability about um, above 75% or something. And at some places, I'll show you another photo here. Um, it, I think somewhere there, there's a leaf that it picked up as an avocado, or I think it's that one. And, but the probability on that one was like 45%. So if you are going to use this to do these counts, then you can easily say if something's above, uh, below a certain threshold of probability, just discard it because it's probably a leaf or something else. Um, so um, you'll see on the next one, yes. You'll see there's an avocado which is very clearly visible, but it didn't pick it up. So this just goes to show that my model uh, of 50, um, pictures that I uh, fed the thing um, wasn't good enough. I have to give it more training. Um, but I mean, for 50 photos and a first try, 
um, this was rather impressive that it, it actually got pretty good. Um, the statistic was, I think it was 60% um, accurate. Um, so 60%, uh, I think the Australian study that I mentioned earlier put the human estimate um, at 65%. So um, being 60% accurate with something that I trained in an evening, um, I think is, is a good indication. So this is something we'll definitely take forward. So the idea here is to maybe put this thing on a rover or something that, that goes through the orchard and it'll drive through, it'll take a nice panoramic um, photograph of each row, upload that to the service, the service will identify, um, it'll give you all those little squares with the probability, you'll decide what you want to count and what not, um, and then you'll have your count. And um, hopefully we can get it to be quite accurate in future. Um, and uh, initially we'll probably just take the photos by hand, walk through and do a panorama or something. We'll see how we're going to do it. Um, but in the end, we're trying to get to something that's autonomous. You send a rover out, go and do a fruit, fruit count, come back and you have your information on your fruit count. And uh, this is something that's, um, uh, that uh, you can do right now with the technology that's available right now. And I mean, just the fact that I could do it with basically no machine learning background is a testament to how easy it has become. So it's becoming a real possibility and quite easy to do. Um, any questions about this? I believe, I believe that the fruit has different temperature than the leaf. So if you do something, let's say at night, you know, there are already cameras that can see people at night because of the heat of the body. So maybe the differences of temperature can do something the, in other cameras. I'm not into this uh, technique, but I'm thinking about it. Yes, uh, thank you. That's a very good point. Um, one thing that we have thought about is to experiment with different um, cameras. So you can go um, maybe look at uh, infrared cameras. You can look at um, different spectrums. Um, so what we've done here is basically just a visible spectrum, but we can go and look at different uh, spectral cameras and see if we might identify something easier um, because the downside here is if it cannot see the fruit, it can't count it, obviously. So if it's a bit obscured by a leaf, it'll probably put, um, uh, uh, pick it up. If it's a bit in the dark, it'll put, uh, pick it up. But if it's not visible, it won't pick it up. And um, this is now nice because it's on the trellis. So you have a nice openly pulled tree. On a conventional orchard, this will be much harder. Um, you might have to stick the camera into the tree and turn it around there or something. But um, that's the definitely something we need to do is to um, look and see if at different spectrums, um, if we can't get a clearer picture uh, where we can differentiate fruit and make it ju just make it easier for the for the computer vision model to identify it. Yeah, I'm gonna... As you know, I'm very much interested in estimation of the crop. I'm, I, I think I missed uh, what you were talking uh, before with the guy from the company of, uh, that is making the pictures with the drone. But if you, for example, you'll have measurements of uh, harvesting for, let's say, for three years, so you know, you have already a map that you did, that the computer did with colors that shows you where's the, the spots with the high yields and where's the spots with the low yield, and you have a map. Is there no technique that can combine his pictures that he's doing with a drone with your and make some kind of correlation? I, th I think that's the ultimate goal, is to do that, is to gather as much information as possible and to try and make those correlations. So that um, if we fly over the, uh, with a drone, now we, l we have, let's say, tree health statistics, and we have um, the other thing that they're doing also is they measure the tree volume and all that. So now you can get automated, let's say, um, uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, efficiency, yield efficiency and all that. 
So if you do a crop estimate and you have the tree volume and all that is done automatically with a drone or something that goes out and, and uh, someone's not really setting foot in the orchard, but you have all these things that can happen in real time. And you can go in multiple times through the season and do that and even correlate it sort of in a, in a time series fashion. How does it change over time? And how does the change over time affect the ultimate performance? So it's not, not only taking a slice of one thing at a certain time um, in the orchard either. It's trying to be there all the time and seeing how um, as, as things um, went along uh, through time, how that also correlates to what you're getting in the end. Okay. And, and, and the whole point of this is that this only really becomes possible if data get, gets captured as automatically as possible um, and in as real time as possible and with basically with as little, uh, little human involvement as possible because that's only when you're going to have all this integrated data that allows you to do all this. Okay, thank you, Edran. I think Edran did his best to tone it down for us. So thanks for that. Um, okay. Okay, so next up is Mark Buell. Um, while Mark comes up, I just want to mention, um, because we're running into tea, I spoke to my boss, Donovan, and he said um, he agrees. I think we're going to carry on through tea break. Um, so if you guys feel like you need a stretch or you want to go to the loo or something, please get up, do what you want. Um, I rather think let's try and move through the program and rather try and finish earlier um, than half past five that's on the program. So um, if you bear with us, I think, you know, have a stretch if you want um, and do your thing. Um, Mark, uh, from my side, again, thanks for coming through. Um, Mark will need to assist me in uh, introducing himself. So Mark, maybe if you don't mind, just give a little rundown about who you are, where you're from. Um, I don't know Mark for that long, um, but one thing I've realized with Mark, and I think that you've seen that today, is we like to um, surround ourselves with passionate people, and Mark definitely lacks no passion, and I think Mark most likely has passion in more than one field uh, from what I've gathered, gathered, probably about nine different fields. So, um, Mark, it's been a privilege, and um, yeah, really, thank you for coming, and yeah, give it a go. Thanks. Hello, my name is Mark Buell, and I'm with a company, uh, my company, Data Harvest. And um, today we wanted to uh, have a discussion about blockchain. Um, so maybe if we could pull up the video up there, guys. There we go. So before she starts it, actually, if you could pause it right there really quick. So what this is, what I'm going to share with you, I, what I want to talk to you about today is the grower message and how you share that grower message without any intermediaries all the way to your consumer. How do you tell them the story of your fruit? How do you tell them how great the Maluma is? How do you tell them how to ripen the Maluma? You don't really have, as a farmer, the ability to go into a consumer's home and tell them what's going on, how to deal with the fruit, how to work with it. So data harvest is working on the blockchain in general. We work across all aspects of it. We work from the nursery side to the research side with the University of California, all the way to the retail side. And we build across all multiple platforms and such forth. So anyways, what I want to show you today is a project that we've been working on. And it's patented, so don't go and try and steal it. But anyways, we'll start here. And I'm going to show you. This is something that a development team of ours in Russia built about a year ago. And uh, it's something that, that they had built and shared with me. And uh, it kind of sparked my imagination. So I wanted to kind of spark your imagination. So let's go ahead and roll that video. And imagine an avocado. Aplicativo. Na frente da latinha com a câmera. Aperta o play. Olha isso, que coisa sensacional. Olha 
Olha que bonitinho. <risos> Olha isso. mexendo a lata e sim aqui em cima olha lá dentro da lata que coisa demais cara olha isso <risos> Okay, so we'll start with that and go ahead and we'll jump into the PowerPoint presentation here briefly. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Next slide, please. So, how many of you here know what blockchain is? Have you heard of it? Can you raise your hand? That's it? Well, actually, last year when I was here uh, at Avocado Brainstorming, I gave a speech where I fell off the stage so everybody would remember me. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, only three people raised their hand. So it's actually encouraging to see that quite a few more of you are now raising your hand. Blockchain, for a very simple definition, is a solution for handling an ocean of data in a secure, permanent, collaborative, and actionable way. So I'll just go down here. So data harvest, we, tr we, we tend to work on this side of this blockchain piece, where you see the red here. We're working with what Xander and these gentlemen here are working on. We're trying to build the blockchain and gather the information without an oracle in the middle. And some people may not understand what I mean by that, but one of the challenges that they talked about was that you've always got to have a person putting the data in. You constantly need to have somebody there telling you this is on the Excel spreadsheet, they're writing it down, they've got a pamphlet, whatever, whatever, they're capturing that information in the field. What we try and do is make that just happen. We do it through wearables, we do it through all different, different types of uh, technology so that when the farmer goes to work and when his workers come onto the farm, all the data is being collected without the human interaction. As they move around the farm, their, their position is, is, is uh, recorded and the data is collected and it's brought into the chain. The idea behind that is, is that garbage in, garbage out. What we see is you've got these big retailer positions here that are trying to build a chain of blockchain to sell to these consumers on this side. And what we're finding is, is that it's garbage in because they're bringing it from this point of the chain. They don't understand is that, you know, who are the parents of that avocado? Who, you know, is it GMO? Is it uh, organic? All those components that come down from the nursery to the grower to the packer aren't being included in that chain. So we wanted to develop something that did that. As we were doing this, um, and this is our main area of focus, like I said here. Yep. Yeah, you bet, just a step over. Um, what we found is, is that this part is the real sexy part obviously. That's where the big money was. So we started coming up with some ideas. And one of those ideas was how do we interact without an intermediary into the consumer's home and bring them the information from the grower, from the nursery, and from the packer, which is so important when you're telling the story of the fruit. So let's go next slide. So what we're working on. We're working on being able to push a, message, push a message into the end consumer's home. Doesn't matter if the consumer was the gentleman or the female that went in and bought the fruit. As long as they hold the fruit in their hands, we want to be able to push a message, push a message to him. Say that at 10 times. 
Uh, developing a compulsory reason for consumers to work through an application. Okay, everybody's got a phone, everybody's got a million applications, and telling somebody that they needed to put an application in their phone is not the easiest thing to do, to be honest. It's hard to get a click-through rate, all these components. So what we did is we had to come up with that compelling reason. Why does somebody want to put an app on their phone? Why do they have to have that app every single day? Why do they have to utilize it every single day? Food safety. Mothers, they care dearly about their children. They want to make sure that they have the safest food in their hand. Older people, you know, they need, they need to make sure that what they're putting in their bodies is, is healthy. Um, if there's food recalls, all those kind of things, we wanted to be able to address those issues with this system. Um, we wanted something that create something that speaks to the largest demographic that are purchasing, purchasing avocados globally. You know, I've had the, the uh, opportunity to sit and listen to avocados from Mexico, and they have millions and millions of dollars to spend on advertising and marketing of avocados. And what they found was the advertising dollars were going to waste on the millennials. The biggest demographic that the marketing ROI came in on was on the young children and the older adults. That's who they were seeing, what they were picking up. Millennials were just buying avocados, and they didn't seem to have real effect on that. So how do you talk to the millennials? How do you interact with them? It's difficult. They're constantly buried in their phone. I see some of you now, this guy right here, he's got his phone going, he's not even listening to me. That's okay, you know, that's the way people work. And so I have to talk to that audience, and I'm perfectly fine with that. So also, I needed something that transcends language transcends culture, transcends political boundaries. I sell a shitload of fruit into China. And you know what they do in China? My mother-in-law, who's from China, she takes a green heart avocado and literally tries to eat it like an apple. She thinks that's the way it's supposed to be. Nobody tells her differently. And how do you tell her differently? And Chinese love to gift things to other people. So when they gift it to somebody else, how are they gonna be compelled to understand what it is how are they going to get that same message? How are we going to tell them about how to handle a Maluma? So, this is what we did. We started with the idea of being able to trigger off of a PLU and be able to tell the story. This is a very simple model. You could be putting their growing seasons, ripening instructions, whatever it is you so choose. You have the ability to share from that, a very basic, simple message. So I took this message to some of my global retail friends, and they freaked out. They're like, oh my god, this is amazing. What do we do? How do we, how do, we do this? Well, the thing is, is that this has been around for four or five years. This isn't new technology. You needed to do something else to make it really stand out. So what we did was, we started, we shared this with Morrison's, for example. They have a new program where you, where they're trying to use um, avocados that aren't exactly number ones, they're number twos. And they wanna be able to tell people how to handle them. So what we did is we made a trigger off of their PLU that they're utilizing to give somebody a video experience of how to walk them through. I mean, the people in England cut their hands cutting through avocados. We needed to show them how to do this. They were, they were in serious trouble. So we'll let this play through. It runs you through the whole process of how to pick it, how to, or how to, you know, ripen it in a bag and all this stuff. But what's interesting about this is, like I said, everybody's doing AR. This isn't anything special. So you guys are probably going, oh, who gives a hoot? Here's where it gets fun. Let's assume that that was the message that you sent home with, grandma took that home and put that avocado in the bag like it tells her to do. Three days later, there's a food recall. How do you communicate to that lady who's just gone through that process of putting it in a bag and letting it ripen for three days that it's not gonna be safe to eat three days later? So what we found was we wanted to put a component of food safety in it, which we said we talked about before. So what we did is we actually embedded, embedded two triggers. We can embed up to four, but there's two triggers in there. One trigger is an optical trigger, the second one is a QR code, and the third is actually a cryptocurrency wallet. And in those embed embedments, what we have is the ability to change the message on the back end whenever we want. So imagine if you're Morrison's 
And on day two, you find out that there's a problem with that lot of fruit. I can now push a message directly into that consumer's home to let them know, one, you have a problem piece of fruit. Two, bring it back to me. Three is you're already incentivized because I pushed the, uh, I pushed the money to your wallet. It's actually already on there. So in your app, you'll be able to return to the store and you'll be able to uh, grab or return whatever it is that you need to do. And now you have complete compensation for, for the product itself. So that's something that is, for the retailers, is super important. Another thing for like in the United States, if you think of like Costco or Walmart or any of these big boys, in the United States when there's a food safety recall, it's put in the newspaper and it says this lot of that fruit and from this time to that, people don't even pay attention. They don't even understand. They don't even know what it is. And the message is usually quite ugly. Don't eat romaine lettuce, you're gonna die. Um, it's very broad and sweeping. This can direct a specific message. One, two, you're in control of the message, right? It's not Maluma's terrible. It's, hey, you know, this wasn't the best Maluma for you. Bring it back. We're going to trade it out. You know, that kind of thing. So the idea is it really allows you to send that message and control that information on your own. And again, like I said, it allows you to push uh, compensation, gamify the entire experience. Here's the other thing that the retailers thought was really cool about this was they're trying to find a way to transition from a brick and mortar store to an e-commerce store. And that's hard to do. Um, so this is something that allows somebody, when they have an eating experience like Maluma that they really enjoy, how are they going to replicate that? Are they gonna jump in their car and run back down to Woolworths and hopefully grab the exact same lot of fruit? We don't know. It's very difficult in the United States to grab the same thing. But what if that Maluma was so amazing at tonight's dinner all you did was push a button and the exact same lot and the exact same fruit showed up on your doorstep tomorrow or the next day or next week or next year. You can do whatever you want. It's up to you and it really is a bridge now for the consumer to replicate that eating experience constantly for them. Um, so that is something that they found very exciting. That's something that we've been working to. And um, like we said, we've got a direct message into the consumer's home. We have immediate notification platform for food safety issues to be communicated. We also added an active shelf life monitor. So let's say we're talking about eggs. What if we're talking about milk? You name it. I can tell you exactly when it is to be used. I can actually send you the recipe to put it and use it tonight for dinner. All those things come from that, from that piece. Um, there's variable levels of privacy, and it's consumer driven. Hey, if you don't want to know that you're going to die if you eat this, go ahead. I won't send you the notification. That's up to you. Um, but we're happy to inundate you with offers, marketing, suggestions, whatever you so choose, and you can set that level as a consumer. Gamification for the consumers. You can, you know, I don't know about here, but in Asia, you see people running around in Pokemon groups trying to chase down a Pokemon with their application on their phone. And it's hilarious to watch, but that's the culture, and that's the culture that you guys in South Africa are gonna be selling to in the future. Um, marketing dollar ROI. When you spend a dollar on a coupon and somebody throws it in the trash, what good is that? When you put it on this piece and people are using it and you're creating an economy of trade and commerce, things get really interesting. A system to push financial incentives directly to the consumers. Again, you can, deposit, pull, you can do whatever you want. You can create an economy that makes sense and drives the consumer back to your product. And that is all I have, so thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, any questions for Mark? Uh, two questions, just one. Um, Mark, how do you actually <coughs> put that individual information on that piece of fruit? So food safety means it comes from a block picked on 1st of January. How do you actually imprint it on each? Bunker? So in the current situation, it would be handled very similar to like Morrison's would collect all the due diligence information from, let's say, Afropro or from the Fresh Farm Group. They would collect that information. It would be in their box as they were testing or whether the importers were flagging that fruit for some kind of MRL exceedance or such forth, that's where that, that comes. So 
basically it's the testing and the due diligence that the retailers are doing and then being able to push that message if there's something that's out of sorts. So in the future, it should autonomously work its way across that blockchain that we discussed, but that's many years down the road, I believe. Uh, go ahead. So currently it doesn't, technology doesn't exist to put a, a blockchain on an individual piece of fruit to know exactly where that come from. Like we have PLUs on our avos, which links it straight back to us, but there's no way to actually put block one, packed on the 1st of January, whatever. At the farm level, it's, it's difficult in this current situation. I agree. It, it, it is a proof of concept, but it is still, in the, in the retailer's mind, currently they collect a lot of due diligence. They're doing MRL testings on arrival. They're doing other types of testing. They still need to be able to push that message. So for now, we see this as something that helps them to do that. In the future, I truly believe that the farmer will interact with their consumer without an intermediary. You look at Amazon's model. That fruit will come directly from ACW farms in California, and it will go 200 miles down the road into San Francisco within a day and a half's time. You know, the days of paying fruit to travel for 30 days and then sit two miles from my house for two more weeks is over. That's coming to an end, guys. And so we're looking for ways to be able to do that. And this is something that really develops that relationship between the farmer and gives that direct message in the future. But I think we are steps away from that. But this still currently allows the, the uh, retailers to push the message for food safety that they need to. Um, I just want to mention we were at a marketing conference a week or two ago, Donovan and I. And um, it was actually quite amazing. If I remember correctly, it was actually in Korea where um, they had on the subways where the train would stop, they had glass panels, mm -hmm. and it was the exact duplicate of what the supermarket fridges and, and shelves would look like. So, you know, the normal price tags, uh, let's say a milk can or a wild box and, uh, you know, all these different things. And so the people are there on the, let's call, call it supermarket, supermarket app, you know, and they, they just scan the products, and by the time they get home, it's already delivered at their houses. Absolutely. So that's how efficient some of these systems are, and it's amazing. And uh, I think it was Korea, if I remember correctly. I don't know. Yeah. So it is, it's actually amazing what technology exists, and we almost still dream of it. we completely unaware of it. Yeah, we agree. And, and I even see that this technology in the future will work its way into the farm where you'll be able to use tablets and phones to actually identify um, different messages to your packers and to the pickers and to different pieces just off of a barcode that they're flashing. You can change the message behind it. So lots of exciting things in lots of different areas that this can actually penetrate. Mark, just have a little gift for you before oh. you run off. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for all the effort. <laughs> Okay, so reaching the last one for the day. Um, Willem, you have a tough ask. Uh, I f actually start feeling bad for giving you this late afternoon session. Um, but I have to say as well that Willem was kind enough to actually give Paul the morning session. Um, and I think it was for the last two years that um, Netofim actually took the morning session. So. First, before you start, Willem, again, thank you for um, the sponsorship uh, as main sponsor, um, together with Backmar. Um, we mentioned this over and over and over that without the sponsors, uh, it would not be possible. Um, and I think it's, it's really been a privilege to work with you guys for the last three years already, um, and the collaboration that exists um, at the end of the day, let's call it between the Maluma Day Symposium, um, and Neto Firman Backmar. So thank you for that. You have the floor. Thank you, Zander. Um, I don't know if you've uh, left the best for last or maybe you just want to punish me. Um, but uh, I think today I want to talk a little bit about what, what do you, excuse me, um, what do you need to know about irrigation or what is the factors that you that you need to take in account and before I start want to start my 
my presentation. Um, and I would like to be as formal as possible. I want to begin with a story. About six, seven, eight years back, um, when I was still an agronomist, um, and uh, when I still focused on the wine industry, we every year we had a, let's say, uh, evalu evaluation competition where you go as a panel and you walk through all the wine grape uh, vineyards or some of the blocks that were entered and you had to score these blocks. Um, and the winner, uh, and, and basically what you scored on was, was management practices, um, what is the vi visual appearance of the block, etc, etc. Et so this one, one vineyard block, and it is a very reputable um, wine trademark in, in the business. Um, when we as a panel entered that block, you could see something was wrong. Although all the practice was done correctly, something was wrong. And, and we, never, we never could put our finger on it. Um, we walked that block for about 30 to 40 minutes through. We were a panel of 10 people. And um, at the end of the day, I think it took two weeks for us to process what, what was wrong in that block. And um, at the end of the day, we asked the, 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 the questions regarding what was the irrigation shelling, how much water did you monitor, what monitoring devices are you using, a lot of questions regarding the water ma management because we suspected that water management was the problem. Um, at the end of the day, nothing seemed out of the ordinary and there was one question that we asked at the end of the day. The, the question was, with each irrigation event, do you give the same water and what is your decision making process on the amount of water that you give? How many hours per cycle do you give? And in a three month period, he never had the same cycle. He never had the same amount of hours. And you could see that at the end of the day, the, the, the profile pit makes sense, what we saw, and you will later see how, how that profile pit looked like. So the lessons that we learn from, from that is two lessons, basically. The one is a profile pit is your friend. You can learn a lot, a lot from a profile pit. So let the people dig a profile pit, look at the roots, and see what's happening. So that, that is the one, one um, lesson that, the, that we learned. The other lesson that we learned was that although you are using technology, although you are using spreadsheets, calculations, everything, you are doing everything right, irrigation has to have a rhythm. You can't give one day this, next day that, then that, then that. That does not work, especially with drip irrigation. That's not going to, to work. You're going to fail if you don't have a r rhythm. And hopefully I will show that to you later as well. So that's my short story. And hopefully if, if you, for the rest of the presentation, I think you can ignore if you want. So that was a, that's a two lessons that you have to learn from, from today. So what is the questions that we, that we speak about from an irrigation point of view. Um, maybe from, from, from what I, I thought of, what is important for a farmer to know um, if we think of irrigation? And now I, I don't speak drip, I don't speak micro, I don't speak anything. Just from irrigation and ir irrigation management practice, what, what is the process of thinking? The questions maybe that can com come up with you guys can be, how can soil influence my effect effectivity of my irrigation? How do I choose my irrigation system? What will the expected influence of soil be on water movement? For us from a drip, the drip uh, company point of view, uh, the movement of water is, is crucial. Um, how do I choose a strategy, which I will later explain? What do I need to expect from an irrigation system? I think that is maybe some of the questions in the room. I don't know. Any other questions that you would like to, 
answer today or the questions that you came here that you expect to, to be answered um, from, from the theme. Any questions that you want to add? No one. Going, going, gone. Is, is that the main irrigation question, questions that you, that you have? Paul did answer a few this morning. Um, everything is about precision irrigation. Everything is about uh, pre, uh, precision management. And how, how do I reach that goal? I think that is the important thing. Irrigation is a small part of it, but it's not the, it's, it's not the, the alpha or the omega. We all know we're getting in, in a situation where we, we are, where we are going to fight about water. It's about the government versus the industry versus the agriculture. We are, we are all water users and we, we have to use our water effective. Kofi Annan at one stage said, we need a blue revolution in agriculture that focuses on increasing productivity per unit of water, more crop per drop. You've heard this morning, it's all about yield. How do I manage my risk to get maximum yield? How can I manage irrigation and fertigation to maximize my yields? What is my potential yield in avocado? Today, maybe 20 tons a hectare. What about 50 or 60 tons in future? Is that possible? What is our potential where we can go with and how, from a management point of view, are we going to get there? So what, from a, say, a holistic point of view, what can influence my irrigation system? And today I just want to leave you with a couple of ideas. Um, I'm going to touch soil, I'm going to touch some other aspects. I'm not a soil expert. Um, sometimes I see myself as I, I, uh, I know enough to be dangerous. Um, but I know too little to be an expert. So, so don't see it, it as, the, as, as, as the true ref reflection. Like I said, I just want to give you some principles that you can think of when, when you think irrigation. Irrigation is much a bigger theme than only opening and closing a valve. So the question in the avocado industry is always, is micro irrigation, micro sprinklers the best, or do we need to drip? I think most of you guys sit with that question, what is the best? At the end of the day, there's no better system than the other. There's more efficient systems than other systems. Um, I can have the best, the best efficiency system, but I, if I don't manage it correctly, I can waste a lot of water. I can have low yield still. So there's always a human impact that I have to take into account. Um, so from, from, from an irrigation point of view, no correct system. You must choose something that you can manage and that you can manage effectively. And at the end of the day, what do you want to see if you dig a profile pit? Do you want to see all roots or do you want to see pots? Because that is all in your hands, not in the irrigation system hands. It's, it's how are you going to manage that irrigation system that you can create either this or either that. And that can be both with micro sprinklers or that can be with drip irrigation. No distinguishment between any irrigation system. So it's all in your hands and what, what do you want to see? If we focus more on a, on a drip point of view, you can choose to have some kind of strip wetting. You can manage or choose your irrigation so that you can get some overlapping of, let's say, the, the wetted areas. You can have big pots, like almost the, the, the whole low flow continuous system um, is about big pots or you can do pulse irrigation that is small pots. So you must, as an irrigator or irrigation farmer, 
you can choose what you want. Um, and that is, like I said, that is in your hands. Um, it's not a function of irrigation system. You must choose a system and you must manage a system according to what your goals and what you want to achieve. Um, and I think that is, that, that is one of the import, important things. So if, if we think from a long-term perspective, what do we see as, as sustainable irrigation? Like I said, irrigation is a much bigger concept than only opening and closing a valve. And what is, what is all the factors that can influence your irrigation management or your irrigation strategy? We all know climate is a big driver for, for irrigation. It's all about transpiration of the plant and the climate is driving that. Then we've got the plant climate irrigation, um, uh, let's say a relationship. We've got a soil relationship with plant, with climate, with an irrigation system. We've got our irrigation system and then I think the biggest factor that we sometime, sometimes neglect is the human interface. How do I, as a farmer, think about irrigation? How do I think about irrigation strategy? Do I have a strategy? I think a lot of us get up in the morning one day and we decide we want to, irrigation, we want to be an irrigation farmer, I want to switch to drip. That's, that's going to be my success for the next 10 years. But do you have a strategy? Do you know what you want to achieve? And like I said, we can have the best irrigation system, we can have the best soil, the best, the best plant material, but if I don't know where I want to go, it's most likely to be a, a, a failure. So, so I have to have an idea what do I want to do regarding irrigation scheduling and maintenance of my system? We all do maintenance our, on our cars. How many of us do maintenance on, on our irrigation system? That's a big part of, of, of efficiency. So the success of any irrigation system is a is a couple of things that we need to take into account. It's not only about the system. It's about what is our long-term practices that we, that we decide on. How do we see soil preparation? These days, ridges are the in thing. It's, it's, it, it is, it is the, the, the next fashion trend or the next phase. Um, you can call it what you want. Um, there's good results on, 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 on ridges, but we do need to know what do we want to do regarding that. If we go to the ridges option, do we build our ridges correctly? The height, the width, um, all, all those things, because there's a relationship between your plant distance and, and the size of your ridges. Do we take that into account? Do we take into account our orchard layout and planning? Zander, they did a big exercise on NDVI, all those, all those things. But do I do my correct layout? Is my plant material the best plant material that I have? And there's a lot of other factors. From a system point of view, correct planning, design, choice, and installation. Paul did tell you a couple of of, of, uh, of factors this morning. Drip versus micro. The delivery rate of our emitters. Spacing between, uh, let's call it emitters, if it's micro sprinklers or drip. Um, what is, what's our fertigation protocol, protocol going to be? Do I want to fertigate? How am I going to fertilize? Because all that must be planned from, from, from the start. You can't, you can't have that as a hindsight. ESCOM, capital cost versus running cost. Management and maintenance of your irrigation system. All these kind of things is success, uh, success factors that can improve your yield, can lower your risk of, 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 of failure. So what do we expect 
from a good irrigation system. We want to give the correct amount of water at the right time in the root zone in a specific, a specific irrigation time as, as effective as possible. If we want to measure any irrigation system, you can go and look at do I give the correct amount of water, when do I give it, where do I give it, how long does it take, and am I effective or not. So all these principles, the climate, plant, soil, irrigation system, human scheduling and human maintenance, we can take this definition and we can go, go and measure ourselves uh, against that. I think for today's um, information, I want to focus on soil, irrigation system, and a little bit on, on, on the irrigation part, on, on the scheduling part. Um, I'm not going to give recipes or what to do, how to do. There's good guys outside there. There's good soil scientists. Um, I just want to leave some thoughts on the table uh, regarding irrigation. For good irrigation management, we always start with, with the soil. What, what is about the soil that, that, that we are looking? We're looking at, at the texture, the sand, silk, and clay structure, uh, uh, ratios. We're looking at the structures the way the, the, the particles uh, is binded together, and we're looking at the restric restricted restriction layers. So if we take just soil, um, and we look at the different um, particles, that is may maybe the size in relationship with coarse sand versus medium sand, fine sand, fine silt, and if you look here, there's a small little spot there, and that's the size of the clay particle in relationship to the others. So the way all of these is binded together will, will have an influence on your water holding capacity, will have an influence of your air in the soil. So it's very important to know what kind of soil do you have, because then you can ex judge how many, how, how high is your, or how high or low is your water rolling capacity going to be? How easy is it to get air into your soil? How easy is it going to have to get water into your soil? Because all of these, all, because all the way the, the, they bind together will, will, will um, influence all of that. So we know from, from a plant point of view, we want to have a ratio of soil particles, water, and air. A good ratio of that will, will um, then we will have good performance. If we've got too much water, oversaturated condition, we will have no air. And like an earlier presenter also said, no air, <coughs> you're going to dry very, very quickly then. So from just the basics of, of um, if we, if we speak about saturation point, fuel capacity, and wilting point, where is all that points into my soil? If I've got the soil and gravity is, is moving all of the water and, and, and um, all the water is draining because of gravity, we're in, in saturated conditions. As soon as we get to an equilib equilibrium where there's no more free drainage of the water, we're starting to get air pockets, and then we add field capacity. That is when, when we speak about your profile is full. Um, so you've got a good relationship between water, air, and then um, uh, solid particles. As your plant was, uses water, it will extract your water, you will get more air into the soil, up to the point where you've got a certain point where your soil particle is, is keeping that water or holding that water so fast that it's not, um, the plant can't use it. And when you bone dry, then we're at, at, at um, permanent wilting point. That is the point where, where all of your plants will die because there's no water left. If we think of water movement in the soil, like I said, it's all about the relationships between how the soils 
and the particles is connected. When we think of water movement, water movement can move three-dimensional in soils. It can move up, down, and, and sideways. And that is because of the capillary forces, adhesion and cohesion forces. I don't want to get into that and all the uh, scientifics of that, but if you can remember from your school biology, when you put in a straw and the, the water rises in, into the straw, that is the adhesion um, forces. The cohesion is, is, is the more normal, normal siphoning um, pulling of, of the water uh, particles, and then there's gravitation, gravitational forces. Um, and, and those will happen in, in certain conditions. Capillary forces will always be in unsaturated conditions, and gravitation will take over when we've got, when we've got, uh, or when we reach a saturation point. So what does that mean? When, when we say um, water moves symmetric or three-dimensional, if I wet this, water will always have some kind of symmetrical force. So that is, that is one principle that, that you can remem remember. The next principle that you can remember is if I, um, if I give the same interval of water, water will move differently in different soil types. So if I've got the soil, sandy soil, loams, and clay soil with the same in interval of, of, of uh, water application, you can see there's a much deeper influence or much deeper movement in the sandy soil versus the clay soil. You get the same pattern when we give the same amount of water. So here is the same amount of water. You can see a much deeper movement of, of the water in the sandy soil versus the clay soil. So that's the next principle. Water moves differently in different soil types. And we do need, we do need to know that because if we schedule, if we irrigate, we, we have to have some kind of idea what's going to happen subsoil because that is where our roots are. So for instance, and I don't know how many of you have got these kind of soils. You've got, you've got sand at the top, and then you've got the small clay restriction, restriction layer here. What do you think is going to happen? Anyone? If I give more, more water to this picture, what, what is going to happen? Okay. It's first going to fill up the sand part, and when, s when the sand is saturated, only then it will take on the clay layer. So if I've got different layers of soil, the water will move differently between those layers. And that is where soil preparation comes in. That is maybe where the ridges comes in, where you try to mix some of the layers not to have those, the, those kind of layers. So water moves faster in coarse sand um, than in fine medium sand. So if you've got that, put that clay layer, it is possible that you can have a, a potential water table just on the top of that, that, that clay layer. So that, that is the practical implication. If we turn around and we've got now fine sand on coarse sand, what's going to happen next if I give more water? Anyone? Anyone want to, wants to take a chance? Also, to the side. So if I've got fine sand and coarse sand, because of all the forces in the, and the, the, the smaller particles is, is um, packed closer together, there's more forces there, so it will first fill that part, and when that is saturated, then, only then, it will take on the more coarse sand. So, and that happens in, 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 um, in practice as well, if, if you've got these, this, these layers. What maybe if you've got some kind of aggregate 
or any organic material or s something lying 20 centimeter below this, the soil. What do you think is going to happen if I give more water? It's going rather going to try to move around it than through it. So that will also influence your water movement. So there's a lot of forces, there's a lot of factors that can influence water movement into the soil. And we, we need kind of need to know what to expect and when to expect what. Like I said, the, the principle is water moves different in different soil types. In light sand versus heavy soils, you can see a 24-hour irrigation in light soils went up to 180 centimeters versus 90 centimeters in place of in, the, in the heavy soils. And that can influence how long can we irrigate per, per irrigation, what's going to be my spacing of my drippers, what is my dripper delivery rate going to be, or that is influence, influencing all of, all of that. Another aspect of um, irrigation management is, is that we have to choose the correct delivery rate, either of sprinklers or of drippers, on, on certain soils because of soil infiltration. Soils do have different infiltration tempos and we need to know what to expect from, from what soil. So in single grain sands, it's always rapid soil infiltration. And as soon as we get to the clays, soil infiltration rate is going to be slower. So I have to give my water slower so that I have time that my water can infiltrate the soil. What is the practical, and I'm going to show you just in a few slides, the practical implication of infiltration rates. So you all know of the soil triangle, so there is also a triangle of sorting showing the different um, infiltration rates of, of different soils. You can see here it's very fast in the sands and in the heavy clays it's very, very slow. So all of this information is, is, is kind of beskikbaar. Um, um, Available. Yeah, you can see it's late afternoon. <laughs> what will happen if we choose a too fast delivery rate emitter on, on soils that, that, we, that we see has got low infiltration rate? This is genuine what is happening. This is in the Western Cape, in vineyards. We, in this situation, this, um, it was drip. It, it was four liter per hour, I think, comma five, comma five meters apart. Um, it's uh, around about 20% clay. So what is happening here? The drip is supposed to wet only on, on, on the vine row. But because of the, the delivery rate is so fast and the infiltration rate is so slow, all this water starts to run off in the middle of the row. So what is my effectivity now? How effective do I give my water in the correct place? If we remember what is, uh, how does a good system look like? Correct volume of water at the correct place in the correct time. And there's no way that this is the correct place. So I'm wasting water. And you can see how, how the water is, is running into the middle of the row and it's puddling and it's higher evaporation and all of those things. So I am not effective. Although I've got the most effective system, I don't manage it if effectively because I chose the wrong delivery rate on the wrong soil. Maybe another example. This was in years, about year six, seven, eight of, of, of the vineyard's life. At the beginning of the vineyard, when it was youngly planted, the soil could take the, infil could take the water away from, from the dripper. So there was no problem with the delivery rate of, of the dripper. In year eight, we got some salts to the, to the surface, 
um, some chemical changes took place in the soils and suddenly you can see it's almost like a small little river that is starting to, to form there. As the droplets drop on the soil, it's running off down the slope. You can al also see there, there's the little river going there. Um, and that is just, maybe in year one, you made the correct choice about irrigation system, but with time, your soil changes and your infiltration rate changes. This is a good example where your infiltration rate changes over time. And, and you, you do need to take that also into account. Doesn't matter if it's drip, doesn't matter if it's microsprinklers. It's all about infiltration rate of the soil. So what, what can I say about uh, more focusing on, on um, drip principles? You all heard about the onion effect of, of drip. In Afrikaans, the oi, um, that one that uh, lets your uh, eyes tear, by, by tears in your eyes, onion. So we can see from an onion effect, we've got layers of different soil water holding capacities. We've got layers of different oxygen. And normally, just below the dripper, there will always be a place where we've got a high concentration of water as we go to the outside, the concentration of the water will, will decrease, but the oxygen concentration will increase to, to where it's drier. So that is the onion effect, that layer effect of, of water. And water can move differently in, in the soils because of different volumes. So we can see here there was a, a 20 millimeter irrigation given. That was day one. And after three days, it looked like this. This wasn't wet soil. So we can see those wet, wet zones going down to the deeper levels. If we gave another 30 millimeters on that, we can see how that gravity is taking that water over there, is just pulling that towards the bottom of the, of, of the soil profile. So if I over irrigate, we, we create that oversaturated conditions and gravity will pull, pull it past the root zone. High concentration of water, low concentration of air, no roots. No roots will grow in that situation. So we know the influence, the, the bigger we can give the volume, the better distribution we, we will have um, regarding um, a dripper. We can see here 20 millimeters of irrigation on dry soil, 20 millimeter irrigations on wet soil. You can see the difference. And if we give a big, big, big irrigation, we can see how that looks. So if we over irrigate, um, gravity will pull that saturation point just, just be below our, our root zone. We are here around about 70 centimeters to the side there is 75, and I think that is about 60 centimeters um, from, from the point of source. Also, the longer we can irrigate, the wider we can get our water movement. But, there's always a but, but I will come to that later on. So you can see one hour only moves 30 centimeters, 20 mo 24 hours in this case moved about 60 centimeters, in this case, 24 hours was about 90 centimeters away from the dripper. So the longer you can irrigate, it's, it's more effective on your irrigation system from, from a hydraulic point of view as well, but it's all about the rooting depth. Your rooting, your rooting depth will, will influence or, or will tell you how long you can irrigate. Normally what we want to try to do is we want to eat 80% of our root zone. That is, that is our active management uh, uh, zone that we want to manage. The other 20% we call it buffer zone. So you want to irrigate there um, only to, filling, to fill up the, 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 the profile later on, the deep profile pit. So 80% of the time we want to look at and then 20% we monitor and see when we get dry, we will fill the whole profile. 
So the, and that is the rhythm that I want to talk, to talk to you about. If I give today one hour, one hour irrigation will be there. Next time I irrigate, I give eight hours. So eight hours will get maybe there. The other day I'm at two hours. So I'm there. So where does my root system establish itself? At the top there for the one hour, for the eight hours, or for the three hours? So you have to, get a, you have, to have a rhythm to say, I want to focus on this, and sometimes I want to focus on this as well. If I see I'm too wet, then I take away, then I take away irrigation or mm -hmm. I make the irrigation smaller. But, but you have to come into a rhythm um, of, of a scheduling point of view, and you have to monitor what you are doing. You can't, you can't schedule without monitoring. You have to know what, what you are doing. You all know the effect, and hopefully tomorrow with a, with, with a field visit you will see. Normally the lower the delivery rate, the better dis distribution lateral distribution we get. Um, this is uh, uh, 0.6 liter per hour versus the, the 3 liter per hour, that one I think. Also in sandy soils, we can see the difference between delivery rate very easily. Um, that's the lower deliveries and that's the higher deliveries. This is the bigger irrigations and you can see you get a much better distribution of, of, of the water. Also the gradient from high concentration of water and air, and you can see what's happening here with the, with the high delivery rates. You're forcing out all of your all of your oxygen. So you need to be careful here of over irrigation. Here you can maybe some sometimes over irrigate because you still got enough air in the soil profile versus versus this. So it's very important to choose correctly. This is the photo that I talked about of my story, um, that vineyard. You only have roots in the top 10 centimeters of that wine grapes. Then you've got nothing, maybe a few medium to thick roots, and here at 80, 80 centimeters, you get roots again. So from, from a wine grape point of view, this is not what you want because the vineyard or the, vi the vine never knew where to establish its roots because sometimes it's, get it's getting three hours of irrigation, sometimes eight hours of irrigation, sometimes five, sometimes nothing. So where, where's my, where, where must my roots be? Um, other factors that we can look at is soil texture, organic material, root canals, limiting layers, rocks, etc., etc. All of that will influence the movement of your, of your water. So what can you do at the end of the day? You're going to see this tomorrow. Hopefully it does not rain. Um, and we, hopefully we, we will have a result. Um, you can do drip trials for, for your own, for your own uh, on your own, just to see what can I expect from my soil you must also remember, freshly prepared soil will, will react differently than soil that is already, already established or a little bit a year or two old. So this was what we did about three, four years ago, I think, Zander. And, and this was the di different delivery rates that... Uh, that is the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 liter per hour dripper with different volumes of water, one liter per hour with, with the different um, uh, volumes of water. Okay, this is a bad picture, but then it's a two liter per hour. And you can see there is the wetting front of that one, there is the wetting front of that one, and there is the wetting front of that one. Same dripper, same soil, just different volumes of water. And you get different different uh, distribution patterns. You can draw yourself some nice graphs if you want to. This was soil in, in Hobles Dal, also the same exercise. And you can see the difference of the different drippers with different amounts. Um, and that you can do, do on your own. But just 
putting down a line on dry soil and look what, the, what, the, what is happening. This we did in, in the wine region um, and you can see also there is the nice wetting pattern of, of that combination. Here you can see a very nice strip wetting with this combination. There you can see there was something interesting with a dry spot that we did not expect. And here you also see a nice wetting pattern, but you can see the wave that it, that it makes. So in each soil, water will move differently and you need to know what to expect from, from, from your soil. So from my irrigation scheduling, and I'm almost finished now. What is the three questions that, they w in the past we always spoke about two questions. When to irrigate, how much to irrigate. These days we also must know when not to irrigate or when to change your program, when to adapt, when to do a technical irrigation or not to do anything. And that is where monitoring comes, comes in. Those are the basic questions. And how do I get to answer those basic questions? I must have an idea of how my irrigation management is going to look like. Again, the human side of the irrigation system. It's all, always the human decision that will open a valve, that will control the valve. The irrigation system cannot manage itself. So if, if there's a failure, you must really look on what, what decision did you make wrong? Where can you, where can you improve your decision making? Um, and, and irrigation management is built on three pillars. The one I already said, you must have a strategy. And the most important of having a strategy is your system must be designed according to your strategy. You can't have a generic system design and three, five years down the line, you decide you want to do pulse irrigation, for example. Your system can't handle it. It can't handle the filling up times, it can't handle the draining, the draining times. So if you choose a strategy, stick to that strategy. And stick, tell your designer, listen, this is what I want to do. This is the, the result that I want to get at the end of the day. We can't give, we can't tell our irrigation designers, I, I want an irrigation system, please. You must know what is your goal that you want to achieve. How do you think you're going to manage it? Are you giving, are you going to give short cycles frequently? Uh, do you want to give large irrigations more more uh, on, on, on a, 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 a much larger frequency. What do you want to do at the end of the day? These days we've got the continuous irrigation, so there's a lot of strategies that you, that you can try to do. Coming back to those first figures or the first image that I showed you, do you want to have a whole profile of roots or do you want to have pots? Because that, your strategy is going to influence what you see. After strategy, you schedule. So you plan your scheduling, you execute your scheduling, and you monitor what you're doing. You only change your scheduling or your, your plan to schedule if, if monit monitoring tells you there's something wrong. My profile is either too wet, either too dry, or there's something strange going on. And you can monitor by various methods. The easiest way is, is to dig a, dig a profile pit, go and fill with your hands. That's the most easiest. More technology driven is all the probes, the uh, cap assistance kind of probes, DFM, AquaCheck, all of those. Newton probes, the more advanced things is satellite. More advanced is um, the dendrometer um, or the, the, the uh, fight tech kind of fight tech kind of, 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 of monitoring devices but that's important you must have a strategy act according to your strategy and monitor if I'm on the on the correct path so how is my strategy going to look like is it going to look like something like this 
small irrigation frequently, large irrigations, or continuous. At the end of the day, what I want to achieve, I want to know if I look from a field capacity point of view un until wilting point, how dry must my soil get before I want to irrigate? If I want to be here, then I must be careful of over irrigating, pushing out all, all the oxygen out of my soil. If I am going to be there, I must be careful of drying out my profile so much that my plants start to stress. So this is my, my fuel gauge on where do I want to be? Best growth we know is normally between field capacity and a point of normal 50% of, of, of water, ready, ready available water. So where, where do I feel safe and where, where do I think I, I will have the optimum um, yields that, that I require? Mostly on fruit, it is somewhere here. On wine grapes, where we want to have, on the red wines, the cabernets and all those, it is somewhere here. So you must choose where you want to be uh, from, from a crop point of view. So to summarize, over and under irrigation have got the biggest influence on the soil volume wetted and not the emitter application. It's all about the, that person that opens and closes the valve. That is, that is what, what is the biggest influence. And we can make a choice to be more effective by optimizing our irrigation scheduling. There's no recipe to predict water movement or effect of mitter on infiltration or other soil conditions. Each farm has got its own potential wetting patterns. Soil do differ, management practice do differ. So at the end of the day, we have to have some sort of idea of, of what we can expect. That is my story, Xander. Any questions for the graveyard session? Questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to just throw one comment in, um, or rather a question. Um, our approach with drip has been that I don't want to fiddle too much with the cycles. So our design, the way we did it there was one liter, three hours. And I prefer to keep it on that three hours um, for as long as possible. I don't want to fiddle with that. I'll rather, let's say it's three times a week, I will rather take a day away from over irrigating. Um, and sometimes you find different approaches to that as well. Um, and I think the risk again with micromanaging irrigation, from my opinion, is that you could say, okay, well, uh, so the plant needs this amount of water every day. So now, although the three liter per hour, um, oh, one, one liter per hour, three hours a day uh, is the correct um, drip. Now I start fiddling with the um, irrigation frequency and what that standing time is. Now, I think the most important indicator for me usually is I don't want water runoff. I want to basically see the drip entering the soil. That's the way I prefer it. Um, what's your comment on that? Um, you know, is it free for interpretation or would you rather stick with that and rather play with the amount of days? It, um, the Israelis always say a good agronomist will always start with a, s with a sentence, it depends. So today I will also start with it depends. There's a lot of, uh, lot of factors, again coming back to your strategy. The bigger your root zone is and the bigger wetted area you can get, the bigger buffer you have. So if you skip a one day or so on, your tree can handle that. The smaller your irrigation or the smaller your root zone is, the more accurate you must be on, on execution. So I am a firm believer of bigger kind of root systems to have that buffer. And like you say, I will rather skip a day than to give one hour of irrigation. One hour sometimes with one liter per hour, with one liter per hour drippers, it's one liter of, of water that you put on 
maybe a dry soil some days, some days a wet soil, some days, I don't know, something in between. So what is the efficiency of that one liter of water that you put down? How deep does that really penetrate and do it reach the root zone? Maybe the top layer dries out, but my tree can take it because there's enough water in lower layers. So uh, that's why I say I maybe will skip one day and give, um, but that is all up depend on monitoring what is all conditions. If I've, I've got a good, good uh, water holding capacity soil, it's easy to do that. If I've got sandy soils, it's dangerous to skip a, skip a, a day. So um, a lot of things that, that, uh, that you need to thought, think of. Any other questions or comments? Everyone's quiet. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Willem. Just want to... Okay, so that concludes the day. Um, for the people that's not joining us tomorrow, uh, it's been lovely to have you over. Thanks for everyone uh, sitting through this afternoon session. Um, really appreciate it, and I hope it's been worth your while. Um, just in terms of arrangements, um, so uh, we can all move down to the tent. Uh, we'll enjoy dinner around about 7 p.m. Um, the international guests, we will just have to arrange your um, trip back to the lodge. So just come and speak to me um, and see how we can arrange that maybe as you pass me. Um, in terms of tomorrow morning, um, so the plan is to again meet at the tent, 8 o'clock, uh, a light breakfast um, and coffee until 9 um, and then leave for the fields more or less at 9 o'clock. I want to urge you to be at 8 o'clock um, so we could actually leave a little bit earlier if everyone's ready um, because that just gives us more time in the orchards. Um, so, yeah, if you can all maybe just plan to be here around 8 o'clock tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, for now, at least enjoy tonight and thank you again for attending.